You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Belly and up to the nine foot homemade oak bar. Pour yourself a cold one. My name is Chris. That is Ed. This is Socks in the Basement. 30 minutes of socks for fans, by fans, and we hope that you will join us on this journey today along with family waterproofing solutions. You do not want to have a journey, say, where your pipes burst in your basement, your sump pump overflows, seepage comes through the walls, and you're washed away down the street into a completely different neighborhood. Contact Family Waterproofing Solutions for a free estimate on any kind of issue you might be having in your basement or with your foundation. They will take care of you either virtually or in person. I've had them over to the house myself. Very clean, very safe, and very good prices. In fact, that price gets better if you tell them all about socks in the basement and that's where you heard about them. Give them a call today. The phone number right on the logo for Socks in the Basement on the podcast player that you are using or check out FAMWS.com. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> Not my best read at the beginning of the show, but that's pretty much it, Ed. Like, yeah, I, I, I nailed that's it. Okay. I, was like, I was like, I, 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 I kind of didn't end the sentence correctly, but I'll, I'll, you know, who's perfect? It's the weekend. How are you? Look, you, you, I'm, I'm good. You stuck the landing there, but I don't think you were expecting to stick the landing that soon. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> to bring it around to baseball, it's like when you swing really hard and you actually connect with one and you thought you popped it up and it's actually going over the left field fence, right? right? right. You know, sometimes you just you just don't know where the ball went. That makes sense. I get I get your no, I don't. All right, so uh, <laughs> let's, there's a lot of things we could talk about today. The one thing I don't want to do is become the angst that I believe is appearing amongst most White Sox fans that Holy somehow moly. because other teams are finally making moves that the White Sox are done. How many experts can I bring on this show from over at MLB Network, from Scott Greger, who's around the team all the time with the Daily Herald, to Dave Kaplan, who probably has lunch with Jerry Reinsdorf once a week, and they're all sitting there telling you, don't worry, it's not over yet, and people are losing their minds. Now look, if they are done, I'm going to be the first person to scream about Jerry Reinsdorf, call him cheap, I've done it so many times on this show, it's not even funny. I yell about this team constantly, but just because other teams are finally making signs, what did you think was going to happen? That somehow the White Sox, the Padres, and like two or three other teams are going to be the only teams that made any acquisitions, and everybody else is just playing their AAA guys, and there were going to be something like 40 or 50 guys that went unsigned? I mean, I know it felt that way in December, but that's not how it was actually going to go down, and no. you're seeing teams... Fill their rosters out. There are still plenty of guys available for the Sox to go add a pitcher and add a hitter. I don't hear them pushing. Like, look, I don't hear them pushing. Michael Kopech will be here opening day. I don't see that message coming out. I don't hear the Andrew Vaughn is going to be be ready to go early, get ready for him push. I'm not hearing them put that pressure on those guys. And I don't think Danny Mendick's your DH. Everybody needs to calm down. I broke it down in the blog yesterday, and and you know we can start a drinking game every time I say the word blog. But with Jock Peterson signing today, because he wasn't signed when I wrote it yesterday, there are ten of MLB.com's top twenty-five free agents left. There are now seventeen of the top sixty on CBS Sports, and there are eighteen of the top fifty left on MLBRumors.com. Right, so. If you're looking at these places that are listing these top free agents, we're still in double digits of the guys in their top listings, and that's mostly guys that the Sox could use. There's only a handful that I really kind of identified as being folks that you don't really have any room for, like they don't really need Colton Wong or Didi Gregorius because they don't really need middle infield, no. right? Or Jackie Bradley Jr. doesn't make a lot of sense because he's a guy that his value is playing the field, not necessarily with the bat. So... If you're looking for guys that are out there, there are still hitters, there are still pitchers, and there are still guys that will fit this team. You just have to understand. I think the Sox are just being patient and letting some of this stuff go. Like, Jock Peterson to the Cubs, I don't know. I actually immediately got a text as soon as that news broke. How does he fit with the Cubs? I don't know. I don't I, I don't know how he fits, and I don't, I don't know that I care. 
but I know how he would have fit with the Sox, and I don't know that it's a great loss to, to lose Jock Peterson in, in the grand scheme of things because there's other guys like him still out there. And he was a guy that splits. He's good against one type of pitcher and terrible against the other one. I don't even need to look up his stats to tell you that. He's one of these guys like you don't even play him in, in like a certain amount of games every year. You'd have to use a platoon system out in, in the outfield. I wasn't and high on him. Was. I wasn't high on him when they were talking about him six months ago as a possibility. So, but the problem is we're seeing these names that some people have said, oh, the Sox might go out and get Tommy LaStella. Well, they didn't. All right. They, no. But th- were they going to give LaStella a three year deal? What the White Sox are looking to do here is give a one year deal to somebody because they honestly do want Andrew Vaughn to be on the team playing every day midway through the season or at worst case at the start of 2022. So that 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 they're not giving anybody a three year deal. That's why Adam Eaton's only a one year guy. Exactly, and they're not going to give a three year deal. Like like I've said before, I want competition, but Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't like paying guys that aren't playing. So what I want and what Jerry Reinsdorf's going to do are going to be two very different things. They look at what they have down there with Crochet and Kopech and a list of other pitchers, and they go to themselves, well. One of those guys is going to end up being on the on the in the rotation at some point, possibly midway through the year. So we don't want to sign a pitcher for more than a year with an option year at worst case two. And until you find that pitcher that's willing to take the one year deal, they're not going to make the signing. Like as you look at the list of players, yeah, there's names coming off that we've talked about were good ideas, but we were also living in a world where we thought that guy might take a one year deal because things were moving too slowly. Now that everything is sped up in the free agent market, now that everybody's starting to realize they're probably starting on time, guys are flying off the board. But we still have that pitcher, and we've used these names before, that's that, that's sitting out there that's not really going to give you much better than a replacement level player and isn't really going to be a hindrance. That'd be a good fourth or fifth starter on your team, like a Chris Archer or a Julio Tehran or a, a Taiwan Walker. These guys are sitting out there. Matt Shoemaker is sitting out there. He's a possibility yeah. they could go out and get. There are names out there the Sox may go and get. Yes, I would love for them to get James Paxton. And yes, it's a possibility if he's not completely healthy and teams are worried about him, he takes a one-year prove-it deal and maybe they're sitting around waiting on it. I think what the White Sox have is they have a budget. I'm not agreeing with the budget. They should be spending. But they have a budget. And until a player falls into the, I'll sign a one, maybe two year deal within the budget you've allotted for that position now, they're not interested. So I I guarantee that there's offers out there, but in reality, what they're waiting for is for the market to come back down to them because there is this budget that's been imposed on this team. It exists. There's no way that there isn't a budget. There's a budget. I don't agree with it. I think that you spend money to make money, but I think Jerry Reinsdorf is more of a guy who makes the money before he spends it. And this is where he's at. But I think as Cap said on the last show, and as we've had other people say on the last show that are around the team or follow the team, they're not done. It just might not be the guy you think they should get. The panic has to end because I think right now, what is it? It's the very end of January and you have people acting like the last two weeks, every free agent went off the board. It just picked up. Okay, we're just finally we're making up for the the very slow last couple of months. We're probably still behind where we would be at this point in a normal off season. Well, it, it, here's something to consider too, as you bring up the budget. Okay, you got to look at the whole picture and and what the Sox have been doing with this rebuild, right? You still have you referenced it. There are still top prospects, guys that the Sox are fully committed to giving an opportunity in the majors, fully committed to believing that these guys are major league talent, right? So. Do you really think that it's a good idea if they believe in Andrew Vaughn and, say, Gavin Sheets, who uh, the Athletic, James Fagan, pointed out that Gavin Sheets is reworking himself into an outfielder because he understands that DH and first base, his two primary positions, are filled right now on the Sox roster, and he knows that he's behind Vaughn in the pecking order. So if you believe in Gavin Sheets as a future right fielder for this team, are you going to commit years to Marcelo Zuna to – either fill the DH role that you want Andrew Vaughn in or the right field role that you think Gavin Sheets could fill, or do you want to take that Marcelo Zuna money and do you want to lock down Lance Lynn, who, by the way, is only on a one-year deal for the Sox right now? Or do you want to use that money to extend Lucas Giolito? Every team has a budget, but for the Sox, it's about maximizing that budget, and I would rather them extend those two guys and take a chance that Andrew Vaughn is going to come up and rock the world 
in the second half of the season or have a few struggles but be at least replacement level. I also, you know, if you look at what um, Gordon Beckham did when he came up, you know, as a, as a very short minor league career, uh, Vaughn could come up very easily and at least be above replacement like like Beckham was and then probably be better. So if you believe that, and Scott White from CBS, we talked about him in, in terms of fantasy baseball, he believes Vaughn's going to come up and at least do that. Why are you committing to somebody that you don't want? You're spending money in a business. you got to make sure that you spend it in the right ways. I am fine with them giving a guy a prove-it deal as a DH and letting some of the hitters behind him come up and take that spot. I am fine with him giving a prove-it deal to somebody like James Paxton and letting one of these pitchers come up and, and, and get it back because I know that that money could still be spent elsewhere, and if these guys flop, you could always go out of the trade deadline and start adding salary. So there's money to be spent in other ways than just simply saying, hey, Trevor Bauer, come here. We are going to just back up the truck and dump whatever cash you want out here. Feel free to be a part of our rotation and try not to shoot yourself in the foot on the way through Twitter. You know, I think that you're making a good point there. With the, And Bauer brings that point, I think, to a head because if you sign Trevor Bauer to a giant deal right now or Marcelo Zuna, you are not signing Lucas Giolito to an extension. Because even though you and I and everybody else believes that they should be able to do all of this, they're in a major market, they're never going to act like the Yankees. They're never going to act like the Dodgers. They have wh- what their budget that is set. We've gone over this in previous shows, that there's investors and there's there's part owners, and Reinstorf is just the one with the biggest piece of the pie who's the front of the organization. These guys expect to make money every year, no matter how many people are in the stands, This is something that they want to see a certain amount of money given to them every year. So if this team, Rick Hahn, as a general manager, if he's given a certain amount of money, it's not up to him how much money he gets. It's up to him to spend it the right way. And if you sit there and tell me in six months, well, that extension that Giolito signed and the extension that Lance Lynn signed and he's pitching like he normally pitches and we get Lance Lynn that we expect, then... I'm not going to be mad about the fact that they went out and they got Chris Archer on a one-year prove-it deal, but they had to wait until the beginning of March to make the deal or the end of February to make the deal. It might be frustrating now because it's the offseason because we want instant gratification over it. The only thing that will bother me is if they do nothing. I'm okay if the idea is we have to keep it at this level because I have this other money earmarked for other things that I want to do because I don't want to have a two-year window. I don't want to have a four-year window. I don't want it to move as quickly as the Cubs did, where it was the top of the mountain and they fell off right away. I want to be like the Astros. I want to be like the Dodgers. I want to be a team that, they, that they're that they always, every year, filled with possibilities. And to do that, I have to be able to sign my young stars and extend them. I have to take the guys that stayed in my in my organization and keep them in my organization. And if that's the reasoning, I'm cool with it. The only problem I would have is if you were sitting there trying to convince me we're going for it all this year, but you don't go out and get that extra arm and that extra bat. And that's why I believe they're still going to do it. You know, I get muscle aches all the time. I've gone from being able to do whatever I want to and not feeling any pain to basically getting pain for any kind of physical activity. Good news, there's a local family-owned Southside business that provides a CBD topical that will not break the bank. Creaky Bone Balm offers concentrated relief for creaky bones. It is an effective hemp-based CBD in a rejuvenating balm. And guess what? It's made in small batches, always free of preservatives and all natural ingredients. It's great for muscle aches, tension, inflammation, joint pain. You can even use it for skin ailments like burns and dry cracked skin. Right now, go to creakybone.com and use the promo code BASEMENT get 20% off your order. Whether it's physical activity or off-season stress, Creaky Bone's going to help you out. Use that promo code BASEMENT, 20% off your order, right now at creakybone.com. Ed, I want to jump in on something here that I saw uh, in the last day or so. MLB Pipeline put out their top 100 prospect list. The White Sox have four on there. Yeah. And it's really interesting when you take a look at it. First of all, Andrew Vaughn's the highest guy. He's 14th overall in all of Major League Baseball. You have four guys in total in the top 56, and then that's it. Now, guys move up and down just a little bit to put it in perspective. Dane Dunning, 
was 98, I believe, last year at the end of the season on the top 100 prospect list. He goes to the Rangers. He's 91. He's pretty much in the same range. There is something very interesting here. Garrett Crochet moves up to number 56 on the list. That's a pretty good jump for him. I want to say he was in the 70s at the end of last year. So after uh, the scouts got a look at how he, he looked in the majors, they were like, oh, move this guy up. But the guys who took a dip, Kopech and Madrigal, Kopex is stunning for a guy that was once a top 10 as being the 39th best prospect in Major League Baseball right now uh, going into his age 24 year. Madrigal's right behind him at number 40. The reviews on Madrigal are still glowing. Like, it's basically like, yeah, he's, he's, he's going to be a guy he's going to hit. He didn't show the baseball acumen that we all saw in the minors because all of a sudden it's like he forgot how to run the bases. If his brain turns back on again and he shows what he showed in his college career and his minor league career, he's going to be great on the bases and have this amazing baseball acumen. With Kopech, it's basically like, wait and see. We don't know what he is anymore after this big layoff. So the national scene now more adjusting to things that we've said, like about, about Kopech, the things that we've said about Madrigal. I think Garrett Crochet, all four of these guys, they have them listed as possible Rookie of the Year candidates if they get to come up and play for a good part of this upcoming season. So the Sox very top heavy. And after that, you, you got to go to a site like future Sox or something like that. If you're going to learn about the other prospects, I think they have a lot of guys that'll start looking good in a year or two. They got a lot of young guys, but the four guys on this list could all be off this list after this year. Cause all four of them could get plenty of playing time. That's when, you know, we've been talking about the trades and stuff where the Sox haven't been making them. It's because it, exactly that it's in the, if you look at the top 30 Sox prospects, you can you can go through and you can go on MLB Pipeline and sort it out by the team. And you can see, you know, how they view somebody like, you know, Luis Gonzalez, who had a cup of coffee with the Sox last year. But you also got to understand that you still have somebody like Yermin Mercedes is still in their top 30 and he's a 28 year old minor league catcher. Right. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, the four guys, the Sox are at the end of their rebuild. This is what you expect. You expect to have a top-heavy minor league system because you've pushed all these guys out and you've pushed the chips into the middle of the table and said, look, the young studs are here. We're going to ride them. We're going to surround them with veterans. But you're not expecting it to be something where you have you know, these tidal waves of guys coming behind them. Now, what's going to be key is, as we get back into the minor league seasons this year, uh, how do the Sox do developing some of these fringe guys to see if they can get them back into the top 100. So when you have somebody that is sitting at double a, I'll pick on Gavin sheets. Again, you say have somebody like Gavin sheets sitting at double a, who's a guy that in the micro and looking at the Sox top prospects, he's a guy that we expect to see. So, so, you know, somewhat soon, assuming he starts at double a, or he starts at triple a, does he play his way into something where MLB pipeline next year goes, all right, this guy is now, he's cracked the top 100 because we see his hit tool, we see what he is in the field, and we see that he's a guy that could actually contribute at a major league level at or above a lot of other guys that are not on this list. If you don't have a comparison, you don't understand where the Sox sit right now because we're all used to just waiting for the prospects and waiting for the rebuilds. So you kind of have to switch yourself over into this new mode. Let's just look at the Minnesota Twins. The Twins have four guys in the top 100 too. We've got yeah. four, they've got four. Our four rank from 14 to 56, and there's they have four guys between 17 and 97, and their highest guy, Royce Lewis, has just sat on that list now forever, and who knows when he's going to show up and what he's going to be. Like, that guy <laughs> is taking forever. So in, in they're still in better shape than those teams. The Tigers, uh, they have five right now. The Royals have three on the list. The Indians have three on the list. So the Sox just don't have that massive, like, you know, nine guys on the list. You know, or when the Padres, I think at one point, it's something like 11 on the list. And you're doing a lot better than the Washington Nationals who have one on the list, and the guy is number 99. Like, you know, you're doing better than the than the A's are on the list. They have zero. <laughs> you know, right. the, the Cubs have three. They're ranked 60, 61, and 89. So things are still looking very good for the Sox. People say, oh, they're top-heavy, but they don't have a lot. Well, the Rockies have one guy. He's ranked number 54, Zach Veen. He's an outfielder. I mean, it, it, this the Sox still have a good system. It's a solid system. It is not a depleted system by any stretch of the imagination. It'll be interesting to see who gets into that group 
next year because all four of these guys could be out of there. But this is all a good thing. But it, going back to the original discussion, if these guys hit, I mean, if if half of them hit, if we have four guys in the top 100 right now. If two of them turn out to be studs and the other two turn out to be, nah, even though all four of them are pretty much projected to at least be a Major League Baseball player. If, if that happens, you still want to be able to sign those two guys. And so right now, I understand the idea if there's money that's earmarked to keep your team together for a long time. And you're like, why would I put a bunch of money into a guy who wants a four-year contract when I'm not going to need him two years into it or a year into it? So I get that. But that's the picture right now for the White Sox when it comes to their prospects, their best guys that are out there and available. They are now comparable. Padres, remember? The Padres have a ton of prospects. Padres have a ton of prospects. Both teams have four in the top 100. And Mackenzie yeah. Gore, C.J. Abrams are are six and eight on that list. So they they are also top heavy with two guys in the top ten. The other guys, Caposano and Robert Hassel, are forty five and sixty two. So they they actually slide back a little bit further behind where the White Sox are. So the Sox are doing just fine when you look at it through that lens. They just no longer have this giant like war chest of prospects anymore and neither do the Padres this is what the end of a rebuild looks like and uh, I I want them to go out and spend I want that bat I want that pitcher I believe it's going to happen if it doesn't I'm going to be angry about it but if the idea is let's not get crazy because we don't want to break this up in four years like the Cubs did four years after they won a World Series then I'm good with it you know because I don't want to break it up I don't want this to be like we had a window for a couple years and we go into 30 years of mediocrity I don't want that no and that's and that's what we're trying to avoid. But like you said, it's all about perspective and looking at another team. So let's look at the White Sox rotation going into this year and the Yankees rotation because the Yankees are always the... Oh, we're so much better. We're so much better. I was on the phone with a buddy of mine from Long Island. Yeah. He was trying to tell me that it's... Like he was laughing at me. I'm like, look at your pitching staff and mine. You, 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 you're just... You're in a wing and a prayer out there in New York. We're... We're good. It's all about budgeting, right? So the Yankees go out and they give Garrett Cole the richest annual value contract for a pitcher ever, right? And so they're extremely top-heavy in the budget there. So what are they forced to do this year when Masahiro Tanaka becomes a free agent, uh, when they when they, they lose J.A. Happ's contract off the books? They go out and they give $11 million to Corey Kluber on the hope that his arm holds up, right? And on the hope that his body holds up after two right. very heavily injured seasons. They trade for Jameson Talion from the Pirates. Tie on, tie on. I know that tie from me. I know that from help my buddy on the Bucks in the basement podcast. Well, see, there you go. I, I, I used to call him the wrong name all the time too. Because why would I know how to pronounce <laughs> that man's name? He hasn't been on the mound hardly in the past two years, and I don't watch a lot of Pittsburgh Pirates. He's baseball. had two Tommy John surgeries. Like, think about this. Everybody's upset that they went out and they traded. Were able to trade prospects for Jameson Tyon. and look, he may turn out to be great. Who knows? But he's had two Tommy John surgeries, and in the middle of it, got himself a sports hernia. The guy's made out of glass. He's Samuel L. Jackson's character, Mr. Glass, in that movie with Bruce Willis, the M. Night Shyamalan one, Unbreakable. That's what it was. Yes. He's Mr. Glass. He trips, and everything breaks. Like, I, I would be nervous as hell if he showed up on the White Sox. So I'm fine with the fact we didn't get him. Yeah, but, but the Yankees had an opportunity to just throw money at Tanaka and keep him in the United States, right? They could have gone out and signed any one of the guys that are out there, uh, you know, any of the starting pitchers that are out there and thrown money to him. You would expect that they could go out and sign Trevor Bauer if they're just going to spend, 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 spend. Yeah, but they're not but spending. Brian, Brian Cashman has a budget too, and and he maxed out on one guy, on Cole, and now he's got to fill in around him. And they're also not, you know, they're not bringing back Brett Gardner. They're going to go with, uh, uh, what's his name, Clint Frazier. Clint Frazier. Field. Who does deserve a shot out there? That he guy's got some talent, and he's been blocked. Yeah. And the best thing that ever happened to him was the pandemic because the Yankees can't afford all the guys they would have just brought back because that's the Yankee way, and he'll finally get a shot. That's a guy that I was kind of hoping would sit in their system for a long time, and the Yankees would just give him away, and maybe the White Sox could bring him onto their team. I, I like him as a ball player. Yeah, absolutely, but they're, you know, that's not the Yankee way. The Yankee way is not to give their young guys a chance. The Yankee way is to do what you just described, is to go out and send that guy to the White Sox for someone that they think that they can use better because he's already an established major leaguer. So 
if Sox fans are going to sit here and worry and say, you know, oh my God, they, you know, like you said, they should be spending. They, they should not be done. And I'd be mad too if they're actually done. But if you're sitting there fretting over them, you know, letting somebody like Kyle Schwarber get away from them for $10 million to the Nationals, I mean, you're also looking at teams like the Yankees, the mighty evil empire that spends, 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 and they're not spending either right now. And frankly, the Dodgers aren't really spending either because they're sort of tied kind of maybe to Bauer, but they also haven't brought back Justin Turner because they don't want to give him that much money. They let Jock Peterson walk, $7 million. They could have brought Peterson back for that, you would expect, right? They're the Dodgers. As I'm looking around, I'm not really worried because what I'm seeing as the market settles out, and that's where we are. The market has finally settled out, so we have a good picture of what it is. We have watched the Padres use capital in form of prospects to get guys as opposed to overpaying for guys that are out on the street as free agents. We have watched the Blue Jays make one major move but still not shore up a huge problem that they have with their rotation. Their rotation does not look that great, and they're not even bringing back Taiwan Walker, who was their big trade acquisition you know, last year at the deadline. And we're watching the Sox be aggressive on Liam Hendricks, give a one-year deal to Adam Eaton as a stopgap because they're looking for a chance for somebody else to step up and take that right field spot long term. And now we're just sitting there waiting for them to say, okay, well, who amongst the remaining starting pitchers that are out there, and there are a ton of guys out there that would absolutely fit the bill as a fourth starter on this team or a fifth starter on this team, who's going to take what the Sox have in the budget or what they feel like they want to spend? Because all these guys are basically the same guy, just with slightly different names and a little bit of different numbers on the back of the baseball card. And it's nothing to worry about. It's not worth getting up in arms over because the Sox aren't really being outmaneuvered in the in the offseason now that we see the grand scheme of things. Sox in the basement listeners do the hard work. And if you're a hardworking man or woman on the South Side, you need to be outfitted properly. And that's why you should visit Red Wing Shoes in Evergreen Park, New Lenox, and Geneva. A work boots specialty store that carries sizes from 6 to 16 and feet as wide as 4E. A 115-year-old company that came out of Red Wing, Minnesota. And one of its largest stores in the entire Midwest is in Evergreen Park, Illinois, ever since 1976. When you're on your feet, the footwear is everything. So why not get an expert fitting? They warranty, repair, and offer free conditioning with laces. And they also carry Carhartt work clothing as well. Located at 3347 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park, Illinois, at 208 East Maple Street on Route 30 in New Lenox, or at 1749 South Randall Road in Geneva. Visit them today. You work hard. You've earned it. Red Wing Shoes. MLB Network ticked me off. They have put out their shredder rankings for the top 10 starting pitchers in Major League Baseball. Oh, my goodness. And this is the worst list I've ever seen. This has made, like, I used to look forward to the top 10 right now thing. It's completely invalid to me at this point. Like, I don't even even care about your list anymore. I'm sorry. I don't don't even care about your list anymore. All right. Nope. If you're not going to put Lucas Giolito, who's just been pitching out of his mind for the last year and a half, including a no-hitter during that time period. If he's not in the top 10, but Dinelson Lamette is, who's barely pitched, and Aaron Nola's in the top 10. Nola has not been that good. I'm, I'm in shock that the idea is that somehow he's not a top 10 pitcher. And also pointed out, just take Giolito out of the equation. Somehow Walker Bueller is not as good as Clayton Kershaw when Bueller is clearly the ace of the staff right now in my mind. I've watched enough late-night Dodger games when I can't fall asleep on MLB Network because they're always showing them, okay? Walker Bueller is the man. This list is so messed up. I, I, I retweeted the list, and I actually put from the Sox in the Basement account on Twitter, saving this image for when Lucas Giolito crushes the league again in 2021. It's a disrespectful thing. I hope he takes it. He pins it up on a bulletin board someplace because I feel like he and T.A. hang out a lot. I think Gio's got a little swag as well. I think the two of them feed off each other. This is Lucas Giolito at some point during the season when he's a Cy Young candidate in 2021 is going to be sitting there saying, well, I heard I wasn't even a top 10 pitcher. You're going to hear him make a comment about it because I guarantee you this is printed and up on the wall. Yeah, and it's 
it's not necessarily even about nitpicking where guys are that are on the list are on the list versus where Giolito would be. It's the fact that he's not even there that makes no sense. And it gets back to something last year, like, for example, when he threw that no-hitter and everyone's like, ah, it's just the Pirates. Well, yeah, everybody knows the Pirates were really, really bad last year, and they had nobody in their lineup. But still, there were a whole bunch of other pitchers who went out and pitched against the Pirates that gave up hits. He, he was in the top 10 voting for the Cy Young two years in a row. He's got a whip in 2019 in his full season of 1.064. There are closers that don't have that whip. That's, right. the, that's the kind of whip you see from a closer, not a starting pitcher. And in 2020, he fouls it up with the exact same consistency of 1.037. His ERA and his fielding independent pitching are almost identical for the last two years, showing that he actually basically takes the fielders out of the game because he's so efficient as a pitcher. And he's not one of the top 10 pitchers in baseball? I mean, it's, it, I, 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 I'm going to have to turn off MLB Network for at least a week. Like, I can't even flip to it. Like, I'm just, I'm just angry. Uh, you know, if, uh, thank God Steven Nelson was on about a week or two ago because I would have spent half the interview yelling at him and it's not even his fault. I would have just been like, Steven, what the hell, not man? Even, not even his show. No, he, he it's didn't. not even his show, but I'm like, he's from the network. Like, I almost called him on the phone. I almost, like, picked up my phone last night. Just go, man, what's, what's going on here? It, it, it's, Although, it's absolutely I do ridiculous. have a feeling, though, that Steven Nelson on the other end of the line would have been like, I don't know. Yeah, or you would have just been like, who the heck is this? Is this that guy from that podcast? How did you get my number? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you on my driveway? <laughs> Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.